Um, so what we're going to do is talk about that activity guide first, like I said. So the activity guide is available as a PDF online. You can go snag it right now from those that curriculum connections page under current teachers. And um, it currently has about 30 activities kind of all over the place as far as, you know, covering science, history, art, a little bit of everything. So you can kind of find what you need. We recently reorganized all the activities in it um, and made a new table of contents. And Leah helped me correlate them with NGSS. So that's a separate document. But if you need that, let me know. It will be up on the website soon. They just haven't loaded it because they're reformatting the website. And um, like I said, I've written about five more new activities that are going to be in a supplemental document this year, and then they'll be part of that packet next year. And I'm always game for new ideas. I love writing curriculum. So if you have something that you kind of need or, you know, fills a hole, or if you write a really cool activity and want to contribute it, um, there's quite a few activities in the guide that were written by teachers and they're credited in there. And, um, you know, I spiff them up and make them look all pretty and the same as everything else, but they're teacher activities and they're teacher created and tested. So definitely um, keep that in mind and we will, uh, you know, incorporate them and other teachers can use them, which is pretty awesome. So we uh, have quite a few um, activity options that are available for you. So let's look at the table of contents. Um, so the classroom activities, like I said, we just reorganized them. So the sections, uh, you know, the chapters are the Chinook salmon life cycle and migration, um, fish identification and anatomy, all about our waters. So this, you know, is got some limnology type stuff, water quality, macroinvertebrates, um, stream flow, all of those kind of pieces. And then we have, um, Cross-curricular activities, so Latin lingo obviously involves some language work. Um, Giotaku is an art form um, where you paint fish, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then um, some stuff where you make like marketing plans and um, journaling, bits and pieces like that. Then we have a whole section on aquatic invasive species. So again, that's a hot button topic right now. So we pulled those out to their own section. And then there's a bunch of appendices. So curriculum connections that tie our curriculum to other ones you might be certified in. So if you're certified in Project Wild or Project Wet, um, these are activities in those other guides that link well to salmon in the classroom. And again, thanks to Leah for digging through all those guides and making those connections. Um, we also have a web resources list compiled. And again, some of those, you know, sometimes web links break because the partner organizations don't keep them up. But we try to keep that updated with a lot of cool resources that you can use on the web. Um, equipment list. So I've been asked by a lot of teachers, like, I got a $1,000 grant. What should I spend it on? So this is kind of that wish list type of spending list. Um, you know, if you have extra money, what do you buy? Well, nets and some child size waders so you can go do macroinvertebrate sampling or upgrade some of your tank equipment, you know, go from a hang on the back filter to a canister filter, things like that. So that's that equipment list. We also have a book list. And then again, that NGSS um, correlation is a separate document that will soon be added to this, but um, it is available if you need it. So one of the activities I wanted to showcase is called the Great Swim. This is one I wrote, I don't know, two, three years ago for a project. Um, if anybody's ever heard of Mayo, it's the Michigan Alliance for Environmental and Outdoor Education. So they run a certificate program called the EEC. It's the Environmental Education Certificate. It's almost like a master's certificate. It's pretty in-depth, but there's different sections of the program where you need to create a lesson, you need to pilot it, you need to have evaluations from students and, you know, like a teacher. Um, so I wrote this activity as part of my EEC, but um, the Great Swim, it follows the life cycle of a Chinook salmon. So there's these cards, you know, station one, station two, you cut them apart after you print them and you hang them around the room or you hang them around the gym or you put them on stakes and stick them in the ground around a football field. I've done it all of the above. Um, so you can do it in nice tight spaces or you can do it, you know, out on a football field and make them run around. But each student is a little baby salmon and they're going to go through their life cycle. So things happen at each of those stations. So sometimes it tells them to go ahead. Sometimes it tells them to go backwards. Sometimes they have to roll a dice to figure out how far they need to go. Um, sometimes they die, you know, a predator eats them or a fisherman catches them. They get tagged at one point. 
Um, you know, they might be raised in a hatchery or raised in a salmon in the classroom tank. So they have a little bit better shot at survival. So there's all these different pieces. The students go through it. And then at the end, I always have them go and graph what happened to them. So were you ever caught? Um, you know, they all die in the end, right? But, um, you know, did they die? Did they get tagged, you know, by hatchery staff? Did they get to spawn? Um, and I usually make the students run it multiple times and keep track of that data and, you know, do some graphing. It's also just a fun get out and run um, type of game. So again, you know, setting it up on the, uh, you know, the track or the football field and make them run amok as they do this. It's a great release day activity as well. So if you need a station at your release day, so you're standing by the side of the river at, you know, Joe Park in whatever town and, you know, releasing your fish is pretty quick and it's the very first thing you do of the day. You need some stuff to keep them busy after that. This is an easy station that you could easily teach a parent volunteer to run and they can um, keep the kids moving through this and have the kids do it multiple times. So it's an easy uh, station activity. Uh, another activity, so that one was more get up and move simulation type activity through a life cycle. How many fish does it take is an awesome math activity. So Reef had asked for some of those equations. Well, here's some of that kind of work um, and it's already built into an activity and ready to go. But basically, if you have an 85% eye up rate, right? So you had 15% of your eggs were white and dead in the hatchery in those trays. So 85% of your eyes develop from green eggs into eyed eggs. How many eggs do you have if you start out with 200 eggs? Well, it's 170. Um, if you have 95% of the eggs that eye up, you know, you can go through all these different situations. So this is the kind of math that hatchery um, managers do all the time. What is I, our eye up rate? What is our survival rate? Um, what do we think our biomass is? So they could take a sample of fish, count how many fish are in it, get a, you know, do it by volume or do it by mass estimate how many fish they have. Um, that's how they do stocking as well. So they, um, you saw in the video that they weigh the nets and then pump them up into the truck because they've already weighed a subsample of those fish and know how many fish are per pound or per kilogram because we do it in uh, metric. But they estimate how many fish because an allocation for stocking says you need 100,000 Chinook stocked at this location. So they do it by weight. Um, so all this math is pretty cool. And I've been working with biologists to kind of expand on this and add some of the ones like Reef was talking about. So a math activity. Um, and then we talked about squid earlier. So in the question box or answer box, um, what do squid have to do with Chinook salmon? Anybody have a guess? Take a second. So squid. An ocean species, obviously. Any guesses? Food, yeah, that's a good answer. They are food for Chinook but not here in Michigan, right? So squid live in the ocean, obviously. Um, in the Pacific Northwest and in the Pacific Ocean, large Chinook adults that are living out in the ocean love to feed on squid. And they are very happy feeding on squid. Not that they don't feed on fish like alewives um, that live out in the ocean, um, you know, that same size bait fish, but they also will eat squid. So this is a fun activity to introduce a food that would be um, for them in the wild, and um, introduce them to that food source, but also it's a fun dissection activity. So if you've never done a dissection activity with your students, this is the one I advocate for hands down every time someone asks me. So squid are super easy to find. You don't have to order them through a special supply company. Find um, your local Asian market and buy them. Sometimes they'll have them fresh in a, like a cooler section, or you can buy small boxes of frozen ones, you know, a couple dozen in a frozen box. You just want to make sure you buy uncleaned is what they call it, where they still have their guts, right? You don't want them cleaned out. So you want whole squid and they're, you know, depends on what kind you buy, what species, but um, they're not very large. Some of them can be, you know, six inches long. So perfect size for a pair of students to, uh, to use. So you can get this squid. <clears throat> They don't really have blood, so you don't have to worry about that. 
Um, they smell fishy, but not like vile or anything. And you don't have to huff formaldehyde all day because they're not preserved, they're fresh. And you can dissect them with kitty scissors and um, probes. And I use shish kebab sticks as probes. I cut them in half and hand the, hand the kids a pair of kitty scissors and a probe. And they can dissect this whole squid following your directions with super cheap equipment, um, super cheap specimens. You can dissect them right on top of newspaper and they pull it all apart. And then the fun thing I add on is actually at the end, I take the mantles from these squid and clean them all up and dice them and fry them with some batter and make calamari and have the students eat calamari with some marinara sauce. So we do the dissection and then they get to eat them. So it's kind of fun. Most kids have never tried, you know, calamari. So this is a fun thing even from that angle. Um, I will say, you know, it's smelly and then you go and fry them and that doesn't help with the smell either. So I've, you know, kind of fogged people out of buildings before with the smell, but as long as you have decent ventilation and you can do this or you could do it outside. I've done that before where I cook them just outside the classroom you know, outdoors so the smell's not in the building. But this is a fabulous dissection activity and an introduction to dissection techniques. So it's an easy species to work with. It's cost effective. You don't need many tools and they can learn to follow the directions and participate in this, you know, dissection activity. Then you can scale it up to fish, right? So sometimes, you know, parents have friends that will donate a salmon to them. Um, as long as they freeze them pretty quickly after they catch them, you know, the organs stay intact and don't get stinky and you can dissect a salmon in your classroom or a bluegill or a bass, you know. The external anatomy of salmon is a little different. Some of their organs function differently, but, you know, they have organs just like other fish. So um, you can also get tilapia at those Asian markets. Live tilapia are very commonly held in tanks at those markets. And you could get a tilapia that you could then dissect in class and you know it's fresh. So lots of options, but this is a great way to, to slowly wade into the land of dissection because they're not too gross. And it's fun because if you pull the pen out of their man mantle, you can poke the ink sack and write your name. So bonus for fun points. So another activity, uh-oh, my PowerPoint's stuck. There we go. Um, is called Gyotaku. So this is actually a Japanese art form. And if you read the history on it, I've seen different accounts, but some of it, it's just plain art, you know, and it's been done for hundreds of years. Other times I've seen it used more as an accounting practice for fishermen, where they would have paint on their vessel. They would, you know, harvest their fish. They would paint and print the fish. And um, then tally how many of that fish they caught. So they use it more for record keeping. Um, no matter how the tradition started, it is a really neat art form and it's super easy to do with kids. So again, you could use live fish or not live fish, but um, real fish, you know, hopefully they have passed on, but um, you can do this with fresh specimens. Um, in college, we had a bunch of really cool reef fish that we used for Yotaku that we would paint wash and then freeze. And then the next semester, my job as the lab assistant was to thaw all these fish so that we could paint them again, rinse them again, and put them back in the freezer. Some of them were like 10 years old and they got thawed twice a year and painted twice a year. Um, so it's not that you can't reuse fish if you get something really cool. You can also buy rubber fish. So catalogs like Acorn Naturalists sell rubber fish models that have scales and you know fins and the whole shebang. So how this works is you, um, you know, like on newspaper, you lay your specimen, you paint the specimen with a nice coating of paint, just the cheap little bottles of acrylic paint from the store work fine, um, you know, craft paint. Then you take your piece of paper and lay it on top of the fish, hold it very still and smoosh it to your fish and kind of press all the way around. And then when you peel it off, you now have a print of that fish. It's a very cool art project. It's easy to do. Again, makes a good release day activity because you can teach a parent how to run this and they can just keep going all day long. Um, supply wise, I just, if I do this outside with students, I just have a lot of baby wipes with me because you don't really need to clean anything else up. Um, the fish you can, if you use the rubber fish, you can let the paint dry on them and clean them later. You just have to scrub a little bit more. So this is a super portable activity that you can kind of do anywhere. Um, doing it outside, you just have to worry about stuff blowing away. So, you know, rocks to weigh down the papers. You can also do this on t-shirts or bags or other things. So if you do it on t-shirts, just make sure you stick newspaper inside the shirt so the paint doesn't bleed through to the back of the shirt. But, um, you know, you can paint on shirts, throw them in the dryer on hot to bake the paint in, and then you're good to go. You can do it with ink, all sorts of stuff. So this is a super fun activity that I always recommend to people. Okay, 
So any questions on curriculum? So I tried to, you know, show you there's math, there's art. Um, you know, we went through history of salmon earlier, but there's lessons about that in there as well. Geography, um, watershed mapping, all of those pieces are in the curriculum guide. So hopefully you can pull exactly what you need. Some of them you might have to adopt adapt up or down based on your grade level, but hopefully you find exactly what you need. And again, if you don't, let me know because we'll develop something. You know, I can ask our biologists specific questions and put together an activity. Um, Leah actually helped to write a new activity, adapting one from like the Pacific Ocean to Michigan and worked with our biologists to pull years of data and get everything accurate so that the data in that activity is actually what's happening in Michigan. So um, be sure to, you know, dig through that and see if there's anything else you need because it's kind of awesome to um, add new activities and cater to you know what is needed in the classroom. So that gets us to our virtual options. So um, that is one of the choices for this year, obviously, but in the future, I hope to have more virtual content anyway. No matter how back in classrooms and normal we are, I always plan to have a YouTube playlist now and keep updating that with more content. And the nice thing about it is we're gonna have like a live stream of the tank that we post each week. It's going to be date stamped and that week of development is going to apply every single year so you can use that same video footage year after year and the same thing goes for you know water testing videos or anything else so hopefully this you know is long term and we can use all those virtual options but if you selected that for this school year rather than raising um, eggs in your classroom we're going to be doing virtual lessons that are recorded and available on that playlist we're also going to be doing uh, YouTube live sessions. We're going to be doing live streaming of the tank, like I said. And then I'm also going to be doing live interactive lessons. So I've already started those for the fall, primarily for our returning teachers, but some new teachers. And those are interactive. They're over whatever platform you use in your classroom. So we don't have to use this awful Teams Live like we've been doing today. If you use Zoom in your classroom, you send me an invite. I hop on and chat with your students and go through a program. Um, I've done quite a few history of salmon programs so far this fall because it's the beginning of the year, so that makes sense. Um, but macroinvertebrates, a carp, invasive carp presentation, you know, I've done a variety so far. So those are going to be available and I'm going to have some new topics available for the you know, winter semester. So keep an eye on that. And those you book right on Sign Up Genius, and again, they're free. Um, I just kind of held days on Sign Up Genius, and then you tell me what time frames work. Do you want me to do one class? Do you want me to do back-to-back -back classes? You know, kind of whatever works for you. So trying to be pretty flexible um, and give you the content you need. And then again, I'm going to be creating a bunch of video pieces on how to properly siphon a tank and how to reseal a tank and clean your siphon. Because like he said, if you leave water in the siphon, it'll get mildewy. It actually involves, you know, making cotton balls go through your your tube with water. Um, how to do some tank maintenance, how to take apart filters, you know, all of those little pieces that I get asked quite often, I'll now be able to link to a video that might help. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, okay, so um, we are cranking through stuff, like I said. So our speaker is going to join us at uh, 145 after a break at 130. So I'm going to keep going and uh, we'll see how much content we can get through. So that gets us to the end of the year, right? So release day. Um, what do you do on a release day? So my, my joke about release day is, you know, we have 300 teachers and they run the full spectrum of teachers that have seven fish tanks in their classroom. They do this with whole school districts, not even just their own classroom. They have 10 stations at their release day, you know, very involved. They pull in, we have one guy that pulls in um, experts from DNR, Eagle, which used to be DEQ, um, CMU, MSU, Ferris State, and Michigan Sea Grant to help run stations. Um, very involved things. Or we have um, our longest running teacher has been in 22 years. He started in, you know, 1998. And that year he was the only teacher because <laughs> it dropped back down to one that year. So he's been in a long time. And I always, and, and I'm very good friends with Bill. And I always joke that Bill's release day involves him. And he's, you know, here by Lansing. Um, Bill loads his fish up in a five gallon bucket with a bubbler, puts them in his truck. Then he drives to the river over by Kalamazoo and he unceremoniously dumps them in the river after he's acclimated them of course and then he drives to Bell's Brewery and has a good day 
<laughs> so it runs everything in between. So we have the bills of the world that um, probably aren't allowed to involve their students as much. So some districts just, you know, the field trip option isn't there. Um, maybe you do video content to show the students the release. Other ones, they have to make their release events, events at night or on weekends because of, you know, rules with busing and field trips. Um, some of them do it as like open to the whole building and their families. So I have one, she's, uh, if you watch the show um, Wardens, it's on the Outdoor Channel, it follows conservation officers in Michigan. We're gonna be on that. And the teacher that was highlighted in there, Melissa, she's in Grand Rapids and she invites her whole building and it's on like a Wednesday night, you know, right before dinner time. And they have lots of grandparents that bring the kids or babysitters. And, you know, there's two year olds and 20 year olds. And, you know, it's kind of a fun event. Um, so anything is the right answer. You know, obviously, the more you involve students, the better off you are. But um, there's there's no wrong answer. We want you to, you know, do what you are capable of doing and work your way up. So don't feel like you need to plan this monstrous release day with 10 stations this year. Um, you know, start slow and build stations up and build support and, and find those community members that are willing to help with stations. You know, those Trout Unlimited guys might come and do casting demos with the kids or a local artist might do the fish printing. So, you know, try to pull in some some partners and, you know, parents that will help and, and do what you can do, right? <laughs> Excuse me. So here's kind of a graph of the number of fish we release you know, each year. So again, this is not a stocking program. We're a drop in the bucket compared to the, you know, the stocking program for the state. So they don't ever care how many we're stocking. We hope we have good survival rates. We run about 68% survival, which is, you know, pretty good, right? That's a little bit lower than the hatchery. But again, we're not a flow through system with highly trained people running it. We're, you know, classroom tanks that we have to do water filter changes and, you know, water from a tap. So um, to have, you know, decent survival is pretty good. So you can see, you know, when we had fewer teachers, the numbers were a little bit lower. Um, in 2014, we dropped from 200 eggs per teacher down to 150 as a tester. Um, and we had much better survival. So um, when we did that, we kind of stuck with it. There was one year that we bumped back up to 200 and then back down to 150. And then now we've stayed at 150 eggs. We ask on your report at the end of the year, you know, what kind of what size tank you have, what kind of filters you have, all of those pieces of equipment. And I ran some statistics on that. And a lot of teachers are still using 55 gallon tanks if they started back in the day. Uh, but people with larger tanks had better survival. Canister filters had better survival. Um, and also running 150 fish in a tank rather than 200 had better survival, less competition, less waste, easier to take care of. So the teachers were very in favor of dropping to 150. I have teachers every year that are like, can I get like 50 eggs instead? And I'm like, no, I have to give you 150. But, um, you know, that lower number helps you with the survival rate and tank maintenance big time. So how to select a release site. So in your teacher guide um, on page 3839, there is a map where you can figure out which management unit you are in. And then there is a chart that tells you what rivers in that management unit are approved, okay? So I live, you know, here-ish and right at the edge of the Southern Lake Huron management unit. And the river that runs through my town, I know happens to go out to Saginaw Bay and out to Lake Huron. So I know I'm in that management unit, right? So I go to um, my river and in my, uh, where's Southern? I can't even read today. Southern Lake Huron Management Unit here. And it's like any tributaries of bodies of water listed through the whole sheet or in this area are okay, right? So any river in my area is okay. Stream, river, you know, ditch, whatever it may be. You know, as long as they connect to a river that flows out to Lake Huron. Um, in other areas of the state, it's very specific, specifically prescribed rivers. Um, and a lot of that is because of impoundments. So weirs, dams, channelization, um, all of those things that might make life for this little baby salmon harder or impossible to get out to the Great Lake, um, we have to take that into consideration. So some of these rivers, it'll say, um, you know, a specific spot. So the Sable River, but below the dam at Ludington State Park. You don't want to put them in above the dam because they can't get past it or they would get harmed getting past it. So you want to put them below the dam at the state park. Um, 
some of them it's below the blah blah street or at this particular location or past you know us2 whatever it might be so just be sure to look at that but then again so just because it says that river you can also release in a tributary of that river as long as there's no barriers between the tributary and where you release and the main river so keep that in mind as well so you might have a little creek that runs behind the school that goes out to the river that goes out to the Great Lake. And you don't even have to go very far to release your salmon. And some schools have found that. They literally didn't know that that little creek that they never noticed behind the building actually goes out to the river and they could release right there on the property or close by or a nearby park. Um, the best way I have found to do this is figure out which unit you are in, but then go to like Google Earth and scroll in or even Google Maps and find blue and scroll in and figure out what it is. What stream is it? What river is it? Where does it cross a road where you can go peek at it? Are there any parks on it? Does that park have bathrooms and places to park buses? Um, we've also built a Google map populated by the teachers of good release sites. So there's some pretty common ones. Um, the Yates Cider Mill down, in, I think it's Rochester, right? Or Bloomfield um, is extremely common with teachers down there. And it has been used for years and years and years. And there's actually a returning salmon run on that river that cannot be attributed to DNR stocking, which means it can be attributed to salmon in the classroom teacher stocking, um, which is pretty cool. You know, it's anecdotal because we don't have uh, data that proves they're your fish, but odds are those are your fish. Um, so there's super common sites like that. There's other ones where they release on, you know, private property. Some farmer gives them permission or they go to a city park or a county park or a state park. You can also team up with our DNR educators. So if you're close to one of those DNR visitor centers, and we have 10 across the state, you can call up our interpreter and schedule a field trip and they'll incorporate the salmon release into the field trip day. And like I said, you do the release first. So that morning you're gonna get up, you're gonna go into your classroom and you're gonna start lowering the water level in your tank. And you are going to um, get your buckets ready. So in your bucket, you need a lid. Your lid needs a hole drilled in it. You got to be able to drop your airline in and then hook the air stone to it. Those battery backup bubblers you use on your tank, you pull those off and you use them on your buckets for release day, right? So the battery bubblers are going. You fill the water up in your five gallon buckets as you're draining the water level in your tank to about, you know, leave 25% water. Makes the fish way easier to catch. Use two nets. And scoop all the fish. It takes a while, so plan on some time because you've got those feisty little buggers that'll swim away and escape. Um, I, teachers have told me that it's easiest to have them concentrate on the fish or have a parent concentrate on getting the fish, getting them in buckets, loading them in a truck and driving them to the site where like the teacher manages the students getting to the bus and getting the bus to the site or vice versa. So, um, you know, keep that in mind as you're planning because it does take some time to drain that water and to, you know, get all those fish. So then you head to your release site, you stand by the edge of the water, and just like you acclimated the eggs to your tank, you're going to acclimate the buckets and the fish to the river. So same thing, you're going to scoop some river water out, add it to the buckets, you know, every few minutes, keep a temperature probe in the bucket, and when the temperature in the bucket equals the river, you're going to decently quickly scoop the fish out. The easiest way to um, have the kids, you know, stock them or put release them into the river is clear plastic cups that are like yay big. Um, so those work really well. Or you can use um, baggies, you know, whatever you need to do, just as long as they don't hang out in that thing very long. If you use cups, have the kids put their hand over top because again, jumpy fish. Um, and you know they you scoop it up, you put it in the cup, that kid immediately walks down to the river to where a volunteer or another teacher is standing and they release the fish. You don't want to keep them in the buckets very long. You don't want to keep them in the cups very long. Um, you don't want to put, we had, there was a video that a teacher made, I don't know, at least a decade ago, where they had bagged up all the fish in baggies and then they hike down a trail and over the things and down some more trail and finally get to the water. Those, ba those fish were in baggies way too long, right? So I try not to show that to people, but, um, you know, getting them in a baggie, getting them right in the river. So you do the fish part first, then you can break them up and do stations and do all those other things. So keep that in mind as you're plotting your day, like what time frame you need to do, how much time you need to work on that in your classroom. So um, we have those release sites picked. And if you need help, you can message me. If you don't know which side of that border you're on, um, you can always pick a river that's on one side or the other, because that would help. Or you can call me and I can get a hold of the unit biologist and actually ask them 
and uh, or ask them for a site that would be close to you. You can look on that Google map that's been populated by the teachers. So there's a lot of pieces to help you select a site and you don't have to go to the same site every year. So if it doesn't work out, pick a new site next year um, and, and try something else. So you just have to report out where you went. You don't have to do it ahead of time. Just when you fill out your your report at the end, you have to tell us where you went and how many fish you stocked. So um, pick something that works for you and roll with it. I don't even need to know where it is ahead of time. So um, and then comes the paperwork, right? So in your possession day of, you should have your scientific collector's permit that says it's legal for you to possess those undersized game fish because that's what they are, right? You have a salmon that is not a catchable legal size and you have lots of them in your possession. So technically that would be worth a ticket, right? If you had, you know, too many bluegill or too many, you know, whatever, when there's limits on fish and you have too many of them, that's worth a ticket. So you wanna have your scientific collector's permit in your possession. It's also a good idea to laminate a copy and paste it to your wall next to the tank. So, and talk about it with the students. You had to apply for it. It's tied to your driver's license number. It's a legally binding document that's tied to you. Um, and why do you need to do that? Well, it's to keep our wildlife safe. We don't want people harvesting or taking wildlife for their own use that they shouldn't be. Um, if they are for you know good purposes, so educators can can sign up for scientific collectors permits, a different style of scientific collectors permit, to be able to have you know maybe some native bluegill in a tank in their classroom, or I want to use some frogs for a lesson in my classroom and then release them. I want to use a wild snake one day. You know those type of things are legal if you apply for that permit and then you document that use. If you're a teacher, general population, it's you know harder and they should have fishing licenses and hunting licenses and fur bear permits, you know, those kind of things to be able to possess legal animals. Um, so it's important to talk to students about that. You know, you shouldn't go out in the wild and grab a box turtle and take it home as a pet. You shouldn't do that with a painted turtle or a you know frog. Um, those wild animals should be in the wild. And you know, we work very hard to protect them in the wild. So take activity where they're not going to get the food, the sunlight, the habitat they want, you know, it's going to reduce their lifespan and they're not going to produce babies in the wild and that's all bad. So we want to make sure the kids understand that this permit is for a reason and it's, you know, an important document to have. So posting them by your tank is a good thing and talking about it with your students is a good thing. Um, day of stocking, you need a secondary permit. So this one is on the website. We update it in January every year with the new year's terminology, just in case anything has changed. So don't download it today, download it close to your release day. And I also send it out in a newsletter, but um, page one is your permit to stock fish into public water. So what you wanna do before you leave that day is fill out this page. So who are you? What school are you? What's your principal? Um, just contact information and have this and your scientific collector's permit on you when you go to stock fish. If someone bugs you, show them you have proper permits. If they threaten to call the DNR, you know, tell them you have the proper permits, show them the proper permits, people will leave you alone. Um, and this is what you need. This is your hall pass, right? So that's what you need in your possession day of. Then when you are done, you need another piece of paperwork that we'll talk about in a minute. So to get ready for your release, let's go back through some details. Um, your release date window in the lower peninsula is April 15th to May 15th. In the upper peninsula or the very tippy top of the lower peninsula, May 1st to June 1st. And again, that ex and you can go as early as April 15th if it happens to be warm, but you have until June 1st to release your fish. This is a carefully timed window based on the fish development, their need to hang out in the river and eat and get stronger and learn their habitat and learn to swim against the current to be able to get out to the lake at the proper timing. So this is a careful release window and it's also helped they're based on temperature because we don't want those rivers to be too warm when we stock these fish. We want the river to slowly, you know, increase temperature um, and not drop a fish that's been used to 52 degrees into 70 degree water. Um, so you need to download and save that stocking permit and have it with you. Um, a week before release, start adjusting your chiller. So if you know what the river temperature is where you're releasing, or you can go test it, or you can call the local bake shop and see if they know, or you get on USGS and find the river gauge and see if it records temperature. Start adjusting your chiller a couple temperatures or a couple temperatures, a couple degrees a day until you get to the river temperature. Because that way, when you haul them in the buckets to the river, you don't have much acclimation to do. Um, then following your release, you have to turn in that mandatory stocking report, which renews you for the program next year. And I'll show you that again in a second. 
Day of release, you need to load those fish into buckets of tank water. So don't use tap water, use water right out of your tank. You want 25 to 50 fish per bucket. If they're teeny tiny, you can put more. If they're four inch beasts, 25 is plenty in a bucket. Um, put lids on the buckets that have a little hole for the airline tubing and make sure that you have an air stone on the other end of the airline and hook those battery bubblers right onto the outside of the tank. Aerate the water with those battery aerators and then load the fish right before you leave. So don't keep them in those, in those buckets for long. Um, load them right away, haul them right to the river. Once you get to the site, you wanna acclimate them and then you want to release them right away. Um, place one fish per cup or per bag because you don't want two of them beating each other up on the way to the river and then they get to release. So this teacher used um, Ziploc baggies with some water in it for the kids to walk down to the river. They release it, they come back, they hand the bag right back to the teacher who puts another fish in it. So they only needed like a dozen bags, it wasn't bad. And then they went on to do all their release day activities. I do a lottery drawing every year for release days. So if you want me to come play at your release day, or maybe one of my colleagues, maybe you want one of the interpreters, you can fill out that release day form and um, I do a lottery drawing and then try to go to as many releases as possible. So on normal years, I go to about a dozen, 15 different releases. Um, I have, you know, 30 pairs of waiters. They, they're adult size waiters, so I, they don't work well for tiny kids, but um, I have waiters, I have nets, and I have trays. We can do macro invertebrate sampling. I could bring live lamprey and do a program with those. We could do fish printing. You know, there's lots of different things we could do. So be sure to keep an eye out for that lottery form. Um, so, oh, somebody asked about buckets. Yeah, Home Depot sells cheap buckets with lids. Those work perfect. Any clean um, bucket. If it's something that's been used before, you want something that has been used for like food grade products, not for, um, you know, paint or any chemicals. Um, I had somebody who had a hookup with pickle buckets and they had eight bajillion pickle buckets and those work fine as long as they're nice and clean. It doesn't, you know, you don't mind your closet smelling like pickles a little bit. But uh, yeah, nice clean five gallon buckets work great. Um, other people have, I've seen haul them in coolers if that's what you have available. That works too. Just make sure your air bubbler doesn't get pinched by the cooler lid because that could be a problem. <clears throat> so release the activities. So th this is a page right out of the guide as well. Um, and these are just some typical activities that you could use that day. So um, activities right out of the guide. And I showed you some of those. The great swim, migration fixation, water bug hunt is doing macroinvertebrates like the bottom picture here. You could pull invasive species. Have the students learn about garlic mustard and take trash bags and gloves with you and pull garlic mustard. Um, pick up trash, plant trees. If you hook up with your local conservation district, almost all of them do spring tree sales. And a lot of times they'll either donate them or give them to you at a discount and they're already super cheap anyway, or they have extras that they'll donate after the sale and they'll give you trees to plant. And maybe they'll come help you do a program about those trees. You can plant native flowers. Um, you can do nature hikes. You could you know, work with the local fishing groups and try to fish, do fish printing. There's so much stuff. Um, some of these are laid out as activities in the guide. Some of them, you just wanna get a hold of those partner organizations. At the bottom of this page, we talk about guest speakers. So um, find the friends of the whatever river group and hit them up, see what they have to offer. If they have any volunteers that might come out and chat with your students. Uh, like I said, your county conservation district has uh, good partners. Sportsman groups like Trout Unlimited, Steelheaders, Fly Fishing, local bait and fish shops. Um, nature centers. That's I used to run a nature center for a decade. That's how I became familiar with Sam in the classroom. I used to help on release days for years and years. So, um, you know, hit them up and they have programs and maybe you could do a field trip. Maybe the river runs through their site and you could release right there and then do a program. Um, same thing for our DNR visitor centers. So you have those nature centers. Uh, Michigan Sea Grant has a lot of resources on their website. They don't have tons of staff, so they can't usually all come out to release days, but they can point you in the direction of cool resources. And then the same thing for um, Eagle. Ooh, and I have to change it on this because it still says DEQ. But, uh, you know, Eagle, which used to be DEQ and DNR, um, we have staff offices around the state, but during release season, all those field staff are in the field and they're super duper busy. So they usually can't come to release events. But again, it's worth asking for resources and you know figuring out what might be to offer, where a good spot is in your area. There are good resources for that. University professors or instructors, those are always a good resource. And then Project Fish um, is based out of MSU and it's run by Mark Stevens. 
and it's a fishing program. It's uh, something in sports heritage, fishing in sports heritage or something. Uh, but he does programs, he does certifications. So if you want to get certified by Project Fish, it'll kind of teach you how to teach kids to fish, how to build super cost effective equipment that the kids can take home, how to do casting demonstrations, all those kind of things. Mark also goes to a bunch of release days. So if you're in, you know, the mid-Michigan Lansing area or not terribly far away, um, you can always hit him up and try to get him to come to your, your release day. Another big thing about release days is, um, and this is why it's always nice to have, you know, people in person for these workshops, but find other teachers in your area. We have a map of the teachers. We have lists. Um, partner with other teachers from other buildings, from other districts, especially on normal years, not so much this year, but, um, and do joint release days. The Yates Park is another good example. Like the teachers just sent their own, um, you know, release day up and they go to Yates Park and there's another school there. And they didn't even know and they could have partnered and done stuff together. So um, those are good things to do. You know, use your community resources, find other teachers that you could partner with, find other teachers in your building or in your district that, district that might be interested. Have older kids come and help run the stations for the younger kids. You know, the, the sky's the limit. Um, Reef just dropped a question in, you know, don't use tennis balls to measure the water velocity, use oranges. Yeah, so that's a good one. You can uh, drop them in the water and run a timer to see how far or how long it takes to travel a certain distance. You measure it with a measuring tape. Um, we always use nets if they use the tennis ball. So just in case it gets fast as we can catch it. But yeah, oranges is a great example of something biodegradable to use. So those are all those release days. So then we have to get into what do you have to do at the end of the year, right? So my mouse keeps disappearing. Um, there we go. So let's look at that stocking report real quick. So this is the one you have to turn in. So within 14 days after you stock your fish, you need to complete this form and submit it. This is a fillable form. So do save as and add your name in the file name and then fill it out, save it, and email it back. You email this back to Polly, like I said, our, our admin in the office, and Polly compiles and enters all this data. Um, you do need to have the you know, contact information for your school and you, then you answer some simple questions about your tank and your setup. Like I said, I was running statistics on that. And you tell us how many fish you um, stocked, number stocked, and average size where so what water body what park or location did you go to because again i'm populating that map with good sites what county was it in because that's part of the database and you submit this information within 14 days of stocking if you don't you get a warning email from me if you don't submit it after that you and your principal get a warning email and if you don't submit it after that um in, or after june 1st so june 1st is the absolute cutoff because we have to put it in the database um, then you are automatically dropped from the program for no report. So make sure you get this report turned in. So it's turned in within 14 days of stocking or by June 1st. Um, and we can always give a couple extra day leeway for the UP teachers if they have to release on June 1st. But get this report in right away and that automatically renews you for the next year. So this is the only thing you need to do. Get this permit in and you're automatically renewed and you'll get the newsletter in the fall with egg pick updates and you're ready to roll. By not submitting this, you're automatically dropped from the program and you have to reapply and get readmitted if we have space. So keep that in mind. Always turn in your stocking report. And like I said, Polly's a stickler. She'll send you um, nasty grams gleefully because she wants to keep her database nice and clean. So, and then at the end of the year, there's some things you need to do with your tank. So if you can just leave your tank sitting in your classroom, empty it, take apart your filter, rinse it all, clean it, let it air dry, Put it back with your tank, maybe cover it with a drop cloth so it doesn't get affected by summer cleaning or painting or any of that kind of stuff, and you're good to go for fall. If you need to break it down, be sure to lay your tank on a flat surface. Don't set it on cockeyed surfaces because that can actually crack your tank, so keep that in mind. But it doesn't hurt a tank to sit dry in a closet somewhere, even on end. That's okay for a while too if you need to, but make sure it's nice and level. Um, and make sure you clean out all those fillers, filters really well. You can also descale all your equipment with vinegar. Um, so you can use vinegar to scrub your stuff and get all this lime scale off. And then you could actually sanitize all your equipment um, with a simple bleach solution and the, you know, the percentage and all of those instructions are here. Um, that bottom picture is actually 
what I was talking about with the seals. So look at the silicone in the corner of your tank and you don't want it to look like these, right? Um, if it's starting to look like this, you really need to consider resealing that tank. And it, if you're decent at using a razor knife and caulking, it's actually quite easy to do yourself, um, especially with you know instruction videos now on YouTube and the one I'm making. Um, or you can pay people. If you get a hold of your local fish store, they'll tell you who reseals tanks. It's usually somebody at the fish store. And you can pay a fee and they'll reseal that tank for you. Or you can consider finding a new tank. But um, there's no reason to get rid of a tank if it's just the seals like this. You can actually redo those pretty easy. And you can redo them multiple times. As long as you don't cut through where the glass is glued together, you're totally fine. You can reseal them that way. And then we have um, decontamination. So with release days, you know, say you're using nets to do macroinvertebrate sampling and say you're using waders. Well, maybe you're gonna use those as a science lab activity next week too at a different spot. Make sure if you're working in the field that you're um, decontaminating your equipment because we don't wanna be transferring invasive species from one place to another. One of the hot spot ones that you might've heard about in Michigan lately is the New Zealand mud snail. And this is a teeny tiny snail um, that, you know, like 15 of them can live on a penny. They're super tiny and they're obviously from New Zealand, but they were basically brought in by fly fishermen tucked up in the folds of their waders or on their gear and they're snails. So they can just close up and kind of hang out for a while out of water. And they've been introduced into Michigan and to different waterways. And now of course, fly fishermen fish in that waterway and they might get stuck to their waders and transfer to another river when they go fish tomorrow. And so they've been spreading and they're teeny tiny. So it's hard to see. So you just wanna make sure you decontaminate your gear. So, um, you know, scrubbing waders with a brush and a bleach solution. 409, the spray cleaner you can buy in the store actually works really well at killing those New Zealand mud snails. So if you're up North, and you have mud snails, that's a good one to keep on hand. Like I keep it in a bucket for when we teach our teacher camps um, at the Ram Center in at Houghton Lake, because we go on the Asabel. And I don't want to be the one that's bringing New Zealand mud snails all over the place and hanging out in the Asabel. So um, decontaminating gear is very important. So, and it's a, again, it's a good thing to teach students. You know, are you going hiking? Take a little boot brush with you. When you get back to the car, brush your boots and your clothes off really well and don't take seeds with you to go to the next hiking spot because you don't want to take invasive species. Um, and, you know, be careful about insects and be careful about, you know, aquatic plants and animals when you're, you're going different places. So decontamination is a, a message that we definitely want to get out as the DNR. But again, as a teacher, it's a great thing to share with students because they need to be conscious of, you know, how their actions impact the environment, but also things they can do, right? This is a very practical thing that kids can do to help the environment. Um, you know, and it's cheap and easy and something they can do and feel good about. So decontamination is, you know, very important for a lot of reasons. So do you have brain overload? <laughs> Probably. Right. So I want to show you some other things we have going on, but I definitely want to take some time for questions. So if you have questions about anything from today, start dropping it in the question and answer box and I'll start answering those. But I also have a little bit of equipment that I can show you, but I forgot to grab the bag before I sat down. But um, I will show you a few demo pieces of equipment. Like I said, the battery bubbler and things like that. So it'll take me two seconds to grab that and you guys can start putting questions in the question and answer box. And we'll go through a few more pieces. So that way, um, when Randy joins us in a little bit after his session, we're basically done. We wrap up for the day. So we might get out a little early. So start populating questions and I'll be right back.
So two of the pieces that I wanted to show you for sure um, while I had you captive are those battery bubblers. So they're about $20 depending on what kind you buy. And like I said, you probably want two for sure on your tanks. And how they work, um, it's this blue doodad. So this is the Penplax one. You can actually get these in a two pack too um, because they assume you need two of them. But it runs on D batteries. Let me see if I can pop it open. Uh, so just large batteries. It's just a tiny little air bladder and then a power button. So you lock it shut. Here's the airline. And of course you could put a longer one on it. It comes with this one with an air stone, if you can see that. Um, so you drop the air stone in your tank. This clips on the back of your tank or sits on a shelf and you plug it into the outlet. So it has a cord on it. So you plug it into the outlet and you push this red button and it does nothing when it's plugged in until the power goes out then it'll automatically kick on. So you gotta make sure that that button is turned on so it'll start buzzing and you'll hear it run and start spitting out little air bubbles out of the thing. So this is your battery backup. And again, two of these are an excellent idea and it just plugs into your outlet. The other battery backup you can have are USB powered. Um, so this one, it's a cobalt filter and this one you plug in um, and charge via USB and it lasts a bit longer. It also has a power indicator where the other one does not. It, when it runs out, it runs out. And um, again, you can charge it in your car. Or you can charge it anywhere. You could plug it in in the bus, you know, if they have a USB port. So, or you have a power inverter that you take with you or a battery pack. So these are a nice one as well. They're a little bit more expensive, but again, a little bit more versatile. And they have that power indicator. You can also set it. Let's see if this, oh, it does have batteries. Um, so you can set your airflow to do pulses. So this will run for, and you probably can hear it. Um, it will run for 10 seconds and then take a break and then run, oh, it just stopped. Run for uh, 10 seconds, take a break, then run for another 10 seconds, then take a break. It'll conserve your battery, but still be introducing air. Um, and you will you can watch on the indicator, start it again. And you can watch on the indicator how much battery power it has. So I use this one, a little one, obviously, before I put it in the bin. And um, you can keep track and it just turned off again. So these are really nice. And again, you want two of them for your tank and then you pull them off and use them on your release day on your buckets. So those are both really, really handy gadgets. And you can get those at local pet stores. You can order them online. Um, Proust Pets here in Lansing put together an uh, online order list specifically for you guys. It's all salmon in the classroom type equipment and they ship it. So if that's easy, you can get a hold of Proust and order online or just call the store and they can help you get that gear as well. Another thing that Proust sells and a lot of other fish stores do as well is seeded sponge filters. So that gray sponge filter that you should have two of in the back of your tank, they will start them in healthy tanks and get them cultured and have bacteria on them. And you buy them in a bag of water and then you use that cultured sponge in your tank. Some fish stores um, will take them back at the end of the year run them over the summer for you, your exact sponge, and then give it back to you in the fall, still seeded. If you're gonna do seeded sponge filters, do it right before you get um, your eggs. Let your other filters in your tank build their own culture, and then add that seeded one right as you get eggs because you might not have enough stuff in the tank to keep that bacteria alive for too long. Um, so you wanna do it once you start having things in the tank. And you know when, they, when you first hatch your fish, they don't, eat anything. So you don't really have much waste. They're not producing waste. There's no extra food in there. You do have the eggshells, but hopefully you're picking those out every day and getting them out of there. So sometimes a tiny, teeny, tiny sprinkle of food keeps your bacteria growing and healthy and, and reproducing so that once the fish are eating food and they are producing waste, you have a pretty solid um, bacterial load of that good bacteria. You can also add additives. He mentioned it in the video when he was siphoning. Um, there are seed, it's called seed additives, where you're adding bacterial culture to the tank. It's a little thing you just pour in and you pour so much daily for a month up till you get fish. Or um, if you ever have where you're starting to see ammonia and nitrite and your bacteria for some reason is running low, you need to add some of that and it'll help build that good bacteria back up. So you can buy additives to help. They also have one from Aquion, the brand, that are balls. They're like um, the Orbeez in reverse. So they're balls that shrink in the in the um, tank and slowly time release that bacteria. And then once the ball disappears, you throw another one in there. Um, so you can use those, you could use the seed or you could use seeded sponges. All of the above work well, but remember, you just gotta have that tank set up so it has time to build that good bacteria. Because if you don't have your cycle started, um, you're gonna have to 
keep an eye on the water parameters a lot more and potentially do more water changes and keep tabs on it a little bit more closely, especially once fish go in there. So keep that in mind. Um, whoops, I'm choking myself. So oh, I see a question. Let me go check real quick. Um, how long do the battery backups run? So this one just kicked randomly on on the table. Um, the ones that run on D batteries, I have run them for 24 hours before on a good set of D batteries, no problem. Um, I use the same battery air pumps to haul lamprey around, and those guys are super fussy, so they have to definitely have air. Um, they run for 24 hours okay on, on batteries. They've run longer for me, but I make sure that I change them at the 24 hour mark just so they don't run out midway. I know if I have short trips, I put the used batteries back in and just run them shortly. The USB ones um, can run a little bit longer, especially if you put them on that 10 second on, 10 second off mode, um, and they can run for a couple days, supposedly. I've never run it quite that long, but I should test it. I'll take it home and, and try that and let you know. Um, there's different ones and some of them on the package it says will run for X amount of hours on battery. So it's basically a Band-Aid. If these kick on because the power goes off on your tank, um, it's a Band-Aid to get you through until the power comes back on. But you also need to keep an eye on those water parameters. So if you know your filters aren't running, your water parameters are going to start getting wonky. And you want to keep those happy. So you might be needing to do um, water changes or add ice to the tank to keep the temperature stable. You can insulate your tank to keep it colder. You know, they sell that thick purple foam insulation at, you know, Home Depot, and you can cut it to size and tape it to your tank and insulate your tank to keep it cold. Um, so there's a lot of strategies. And again, those are all in the startup guide. So be sure to look through that and kind of troubleshoot what you might need to think about. Um, the battery backups are super important and then filtration and water quality is step two so keep air in the tank keep the temperature decently stable and keep the water parameters in check so if your power goes out those are all good things there's a couple other ways you can keep track of power outages so um depending on who your provider is you can get online or call them and they can put you on a notification list so um there's certain facilities that have to know if the power goes out and they will text you or call you and tell you the power's out at the building um get in well with your maintenance staff so that if they get a notification that the power is out at your building they will call you and they will let you know so you can help your tank or maybe they'll help your tank um having the battery backups is again it's a band-aid so you want to have some sort of warning uh the you know they always have the outage maps and projections on when it'll be restored so that's a good thing to keep an eye on the other thing is there are water monitoring computer systems sold at aquarium stores that can monitor everything in your tank they'll water monitor all the parameters power um, some of them even feed your tank. <laughs> like you can hit a button on your phone when you're on vacation in Tahiti and feed your fish. Um, they are not cheap. They start at like $600 up to a couple thousand, depending on what you buy. But um, again, if you had a good sponsorship and that extra grant money kind of thing, um, those are one of those items that, you know, you could get and you could control your tank and keep an eye on it from far away. So um, those are always good things. And the guys at Bruce Pets, if you call um, and ask for Steve, he's their aquarium expert and he will walk you through options and chat with you and, you know, set you up with the perfect thing. Um, they also set up entire tank systems, you know, in the field. So, you know, they're good guys to reach out to. And a lot of local aquarium stores like that in your area will probably offer those services as well. So go make friends with them and tell them what you're doing. And they'll think it's super cool and they'll want to help. Um, so keep an eye on that. But um, those battery backups are an excellent thing to keep on hand. And again, you're going to use them at the end of the year for your release day anyway, so you have to have them um, for two reasons. So battery backups and uh, air pumps are the first item. Another one that comes in handy sometimes. So if you don't want to put a full-blown light on your tank, but you want the students to be able to do, you know, studies or observations, or you want to light the end of the tank, but not the whole tank, or maybe you need some supplemental light because you're putting up a webcam, they sell these little battery-powered, and it's probably going to be really bright for you guys, um, battery push, you know, you just push the lens LED lights at you know stores for like five bucks. This one comes with a plate that has double-sided tape and it's magnetic. So you could stick the tape part to something and then stick this on and off as needed. But these are handy little tricks that people don't really think about. LEDs don't make heat. Um, it's not like you're gonna leave it on very long, so it shouldn't make algae. And you could use some spotlighting with something that costs five dollars rather than you know trying to rig up lights and things. So those are always good to have around. Um, the other one I had talked about, and this one's not even big enough, but a vitamin tray and those, you know, tablespoons and teaspoon sets because you can divvy up your food rations in here. 
And then the food rations themselves. So I grabbed one of the old ones so I could show you. Um, so you're gonna get this gallon Ziploc bag and it has a printout of that food chart and then the instructions are on the back side. In the bag, you're gonna have individual baggies of those different sizes. So I don't know if you can see the sizes in here. So this one is little pellets. Um, these are what the two millimeter. So these are at the end of the year. This is how big the food is gonna be. Um, about the size of a nerd, right, the candy. Um, at the beginning of the year, let me pull that one out. Um, so the beginning of the year, I can't even get it to show like individual pieces. It's like the size of pepper. It's very tiny. And like I said, this is, you know, like a quarter cup in this bag. And this lasts you, I mean, you'll have tons left. This is way more than enough. But you're feeding an eighth of a teaspoon total for that whole tank for a whole day when you start. So it's tiny little amounts. And again, you're breaking it up to those doses all day long. So the food ration for the day is an eighth teaspoon, but maybe you're doing four feedings where you divide up that eighth of a teaspoon into four feedings across the day. So that's where that vitamin tray comes in. So this is what you're gonna get for food. It does not need to be refrigerated and it does not need to have anything special done to it. Um, mice do like it. So putting it in like a Rubbermaid tub where you can snap the lid shut is probably a good idea. It is fragrant. <laughs> so um, those Rubbermaid tubs also serve another purpose. They keep the smell out of your room or reduced. And um, at the end of the year, whatever you have left over, if you have other tanks in your classroom, you're welcome to feed it to them and you know keep it for that purpose. But it is no longer good for salmon feeding after that. So don't save it for the next year. It goes in the trash or it goes as fertilizer or the compost or whatever it may be. So um, you know, don't save any extra for the following year. You get a brand new bag next year. When you pick up your eggs, I hand you a bag of food too. So don't ever worry about the extra. Use it for some you know higher purpose after the end of the year. So we have all of these pieces and um, you know some of that extra equipment. I didn't bring my siphon today because I had to haul enough stuff, but that video is always good to review and kind of you know how that siphon works um, and what you need to do with it and how you need to clean it. And I do already have a video on how to clean those out, like I said, with cotton balls to get that mildew out of them. So if you have an older one that's kind of dirty, you can clean it. Um, you can also soak them in your bathtub with some you know diluted bleach water and then rinse them really, really well before you use them in a tank and let them dry. But, um, you know, keeping track of all that equipment and doing all of those things, we have tidbits to help. So, you know, keep that in mind.